Good morning, good morning. As the, uh, as the keen for a day of Neonan Village in Ivory Coast, Africa, I bring you greetings today at 1040i. Uh, man, what a, it's good to be home, but what an incredibly great trip. I'll share a little bit uh, a little later in the service, just to hit some highlights for you. We're anticipating a date in May. Mike Cousineau is going to try to come out in May, and we'll schedule a, uh, uh, an Ivory Coast Africa Day at New Hope Church and show you in great detail uh, all the things that went on this year. But it was an exceptional trip. Uh, Steve and Lee and Lindsay and I, we, got, uh, we all got home between 11.30 and 12 last night. Bill was in San Francisco to pick us up at 6.30, and... Um, uh, last year, what everybody wanted when we got back to the States was a hamburger. Okay, we could not wait to get a Colorado Grill burger. That was kind of tops on our list. This year, it was pizza. And so uh, we got out of the airport, got down 101, got into San Jose, wanted to make sure we missed all the bad traffic. Uh, I, I thank God for Google, and uh, I Googled best pizza in Morgan Hill. And uh, a name popped up, My Pizza the number one gourmet pizza in Morgan Hill for seven years. So called them, told them we just landed, well, kind of gave them a little background, and they said, well, we're not really a restaurant, it's mostly takeout, but we do have two tables. And so we'll have them together for you and we'll be ready for you. And uh, so we ordered our pizza in advance, it was ready because we wanted to get home, and I will tell you, it is the best pizza I have ever eaten. <laughs> I don't know if it's because they make the best pizza or we've been two weeks in Africa that made it taste like the best pizza, but it was awesome. And uh, Bill drove, and so the other four of us kind of uh, napped on the way into town, and uh, it, is great to, it is great to be with you today, but it was an absolutely incredible trip, and we'll, like I said, we'll hit a few highlights in a moment. Hey, if you're visiting New Hope today for the very first time, uh, or maybe you've been here the last couple of weeks, uh, I do have the privilege of being pastor here at New Hope, so I give you greetings today. It's great to have you. There's a, a communication card in the pew in front of you. We'd love for you to fill it out, drop it in the offering when it comes by a little later, and through the week next week, we'll send you information that I hope will answer most of your questions about what we believe and what goes on around here and how you could get connected if you would be uh, so inclined. Uh, Milo, before you get too far from me, I, got, I brought this back for you. This, is, uh, this was the worship book we used every morning before I preached, and uh, Catch how cool this is. Do you know the guy that led our worship out under the tent every morning? His name is Brent Copeland. You want to guess who he's the nephew of? Lee Copeland, who donated the property for New Hope Community Church that we have right here. His nephew wow. in Africa by way of Missouri. All right? It was incredible. It was great. So I've got to tell Uncle Lee hello for him. And so I'll do that. But there's a couple of songs in here that we, I want us to learn. Cool. I am, here's my heart, uh, and uh, No Longer Slaves may be my favorite one. That is just so awesome. So I brought that back for you, all right? That was cool. That was cool. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me hit a few highlights and then some prayer requests. Uh, Widow's Lunch Bunch, you're meeting next Sunday after church. Uh, check it out. If, uh, if you don't know what Widow's Lunch Bunch is, there's some information in the bulletin. Uh, there's a place to call, a person to call, uh, and uh, get more information, but they would love to have you come join them. Uh, next Sunday at 5 o'clock, Mark and I have the privilege of meeting with the 25 to 40-year-olds of New Hope Church. Uh, if you fall in that category, hopefully you got a, a personal invitation. If we didn't get it to you personally, I'm giving it to you right now. We want you here. This will be about a 45 or 50 minute meeting. We're going to have some dessert afterwards. Uh, we're going to get a little chance, but, but I want you here. This, this, I think, may be the most significant meeting we've had at New Hope Church uh, in the past decade. I think this is important for us to have this meeting for our future, and so we want you here. Uh, Fresno Clovis Prayer Breakfast is coming up early this year. It's February the 23rd, so it's not this week, but the following week, and uh, I've, I've reserved three tables, so we have some seats available if you'd like to go. It's $15. I'm most excited about this breakfast of any breakfast we've had in over a decade. Uh, Chuck Swindoll is going to be the morning speaker. Uh, many of you remember Chuck when he was pastor in, at uh, Fullerton Evangelical Free Church. It probably was the largest, most impactful church in California in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, Chuck then ended up being the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. And in Texas, he planted another church, which is thriving and doing well. Uh, it dawned on me in the 
8 o'clock service, Chuck's got to be knocking on the door of 80. Okay? He has to be, because I'm knocking on the door of 60. Um, okay, I've stepped through that door. All right, but anyway, uh, he, just has to, he just has to be there. But uh, Chuck is still, if you listen at all, to Insight for Living still. Um, I, I, to, to blend biblical knowledge and effective communication in one person, Chuck, in my books, is one of the tops. And so uh, 15 bucks for the tickets. We've got them. Just call the office. And uh, when it, uh, th this event is sold out, all right, already, because we bought up tables. But we have a few spots, so let us know if you'd like to go. Ladies, Fawn, you guys got a special event coming up? Yeah, I understand you promoted it last week, hit it pretty hard, and tickets are available out here. There's information in your bulletin. Please note the date. It's coming up February the 27th from 12 to 2. If you'd like to get a ticket out in the pavilion after the service, you may purchase those. Um, Pie Auction is coming up, all right? Uh, one of our biggest events we have, that's in the month of March, Sunday, March the 6th. Uh, please, take, please take note of that. Um, now, I've uh, several prayer requests. Some of them are in your bulletin, but my phone sort of started exploding last night, all right? And so got lots of, uh, <clears throat> lots of updates or prayer requests to bring to your attention. Uh, Ed Dunkel's mom passed away this past week, and her service is going to be Wednesday. So uh, if you'd please remembering to pray for uh, Ed Dunkel and for his family. Uh, Jerry Brown. This is Jerry Brown with now 12 stints in his heart or more. All right. Uh, he had another stint put in, not this weekend, but last weekend, some complications. He is back in the hospital. Still there? No. Is he home? Okay. Mike said they were going to take him back, so I didn't know what happened. Okay. I, the, the email I got said they might take him back last night. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, th there's a possibility he may be, and I'll find that out after service today. But please be praying for Jerry as he goes through this. Got a, uh, got a text last night that my cousin named George McLean has the same name as my grandfather. Um, my cousin George, uh, we were pretty close when we were young. Uh, we kind of went separate directions in our lives. Um, George became um, um, addicted to drugs and alcohol. He was a musician, great musician, uh, but lived a lifestyle that was not whole and acceptable for the Lord. But he knows the Lord. And, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and uh, understand that two years ago, he got clean and sober and uh, got his life squared around. He's been living in Florida with some friends. And when those friends came home uh, this past week, they found him unconscious in the driveway, probably had a massive heart attack. And uh, the decision was made last night to not keep him on life support. I have not heard an update yet today, but would appreciate you remembering my cousins as they make those decisions along, uh, along with George. Uh, Joni Jarbo Anderson's daughter, we prayed for her as she was having uh, a challenge challenging pregnancy and all went well. That grandbaby of Joni's is here and thriving. Um, but uh, it appears that the cancer she was fighting at the same time that she was pregnant is, is coming back. And so they need to schedule uh, treatment starting up again as soon as she stops nursing the baby. So there are some challenges there. If you would please remember to pray uh, for them as they go through this process. Uh, Isabel from our 8 o'clock service is going to have a, have a heart valve replacement. She had one about 20 years ago and now uh, she needs another one. We'll find out later this week when and where that surgery is going to be. Would appreciate you remembering to pray. Judy Woodley, who if you don't know her personally she's uh, out there at the coffee cart every Sunday morning. Her sister Eula is very ill, possibly liver cancer. We'll know more about that later this week. She is in the hospital and would appreciate our prayers. So those are just a few of the many updates that we've been shared. There is a sign-up sheet that I'll be passing around. I think there's only one thing on it. Let me look because I didn't look sooner. Yeah. Uh, parking posse. Um, Parky Posse are the, the guys that you see standing out there when you leave from this service and the other ones are coming in to help with traffic flow between the busyness of the two services between 9.15 and 10.45. It's uh, usually about 20 to, to 30 minutes maximum that you're, you're needed. Uh, we've got a new leader, I understand, for our parking posse, and uh, uh, he's looking for some new blood as well to join them. If you would be interested in finding out more about that, you're not committing yourself by signing it. You're just saying, hey, I'd like to come to the information meeting, put your name and your email, and they will follow up with you and get that information in your hand. By the way, I've been negligent already this morning. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome today. Thank you for being, uh, uh, you know, I think our biggest Valentine is God himself. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, for what benefit? 
so that we would not perish, but we would have everlasting life. And so thank you on Valentine's Day for uh, worshiping uh, your biggest Valentine, and his name is Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm going to pray. We're going to receive our morning offering. I think we have uh, a video, right, kind of a Valentine's Day video, all right, that you're going to see uh, as we receive our morning offering. Ushers, would you come forward? Would you please join with me as we pray? Um, you can tell I've been in the 8 o'clock service. You can tell I've kind of been out of the saddle for a couple of weeks. Uh, I actually forgot the offering in the 8 o'clock service, all right? So uh, an usher had to remind me. And um, <coughs> let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the life that we share in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you that uh, you are just as real on, uh, on this continent as you are on every other continent on the face of this earth. The same God who loves Americans, loves Avorians. The same Jesus who died for my sin is the same Jesus who died for the sins of Samuel and Ebenezer and Ebi and Miriam. You are the God who died for every sin on the face of this earth. Your love is so great for us that uh, you declare it in your creation and you express it in your scriptures. And you would love for us to be a recipient of your great love. Father, I trust that we, um, just as Valentine's Day should not be the only day of the year in which we tell those that we love that we love them, it shouldn't be the only day we think of nice words and nice deeds to do for somebody we love, but Father, I pray that this Valentine's Day will be a reminder of us how we need to be consistent in our expression of love for you. And then, Father, because of the love you've extended to us, we should be willing to take that love that now resides within us and share it with our family, our friends, our neighbors, our enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Be kind to those who are hard against us. God, you've set a high standard. But the thing I love about your grace is that whatever it is you demand of us, you become the dynamic in our life to fulfill that demand. You provide for us the power and the strength to accomplish whatever it is you place on us. Thank you for the freedom to give today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It got hot in uh, Clovis while I was gone. <laughs> Warmed up. Let's see here. If you, wanna, if you brought your Bibles, find Psalm 19, and we will be reading from there in just a, uh, a little bit. I said I would give a, uh, a short synopsis, so um, let, me, let me do that today of the trip that we went on. Um, just before I do that, though, Miss Ashley, would you stand briefly? Would everybody wish her a one-day belated happy birthday, all right? <laughs> Yesterday was her birthday. Ashley, it's so good to greet many of you as you come in the door and help in, in greeting folks and passing out bulletins, and I just found out right before service it was her birthday yesterday. Yesterday is also a, uh, a special day in the Roland family. Uh, yesterday was the sixth anniversary of um, Mom Waking Up in Glory. And as we sang that song today, I was, uh, I was thinking about mom, um, and she glorified the name of Jesus. That's the only story she had to tell, was her arrival to heaven. And so uh, it's hard for me to believe it was, um, it's been six years, six years. Um, well, this was a phenomenal trip uh, that we had to Ivory Coast this year. Every year is different. Every year has its unique qualities about it and makes it very special. Uh, this is the sixth trip that Mike Cousineau has taken 1040i into the Ivory Coast on a project like this. It is his, um, I believe it's his 12th trip, 12th year altogether. The first, uh, first six were done with uh, the Hannah Project name and then um, some changes of leadership. Uh, Mike then launched his own uh, ministry called 1040i. And this, is, uh, this was trip number six. His, uh, his special word for this trip was trailblazing. 
<clears throat> there were things taking place this year in the Ivory Coast on this trip that have never, ever happened before, not only in the history of 1040i, but on some occasions in the history of the Ivory Coast. There were some things which happened that have never done before. One of the things that uh, at New Hope we can be very proud of, uh, because our own uh, Steve uh, brought the 21st century to Doropo Ivory Coast. Doropo is the center of the region in which we go to on the Ivory Coast. It's kind of the capital city of that region or the county seat. You have to understand when I use terms like that, I'm still talking about the bush, okay? I'm still talking about primitive, primitive areas. But somewhere between seven and 10,000 people live in the Doropo area and region with smaller villages uh, on the outskirts of that area. And what Steve did is since he's an IT guy for Veterans Hospital, he brought computerization to the medical supplies at the hospital. And again, when I say hospital, you've never, first off, two of the surgical rooms is a mash tent that's blown up by a big giant pump connected to a generator. Literally blows this thing from being flat to being a building which has two surgical rooms, a pre-op room, uh, and a small supply room inside of it. And before we leave, it is disconnected. It's deflated back down to flat. It takes about 14 guys to roll this thing up and put it back in a box for next year. Um, and that's the nicest part of the hospital, the one we pack away. There is the remnants of a hospital that Dr. Miley built back in the 70s that lays unused most of the time the rest of the year. And two of those rooms are transformed into uh, surgical rooms. Uh, without being overly graphic, one of them in the past has been the surgical room for um, our gynecologist. Um, the stirrups for his procedures are two-by-fours that have been nailed to the ceiling with rope that hangs down with stirrups that we brought from the states that are attached to the end of those ropes, all right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, when I, when I say words like hospital, uh, please understand it's very different. All the medical supplies you have sent many over the years, here's the problem without an inventory control, we don't know what we have an abundance of and what we have a short supply of. And so sometimes what we take back, we had plenty of and now we got more of and things we needed we don't have any of. And so Steve, we, there is now barcoding in the pharmacy, <clears throat> which is a brick room with wooden shelves, no air conditioning. A fan is the air conditioning. But anyway, now there is barcoding, and they know exactly the supplies they have this year, and they will know what we need more of for next year because we have it inventoried, and they are so excited. The doctors are thrilled with that. He uh, also has provided inventory for what we call central supply, things like bandages and gauze and IV needles of all various sizes and whatever you can imagine, uh, rubber gloves, all of that. Now we know what's there. So... That's pretty exciting. Uh, it doesn't excite you on the ministry side, but what we don't understand, what sometimes you fail to understand is if you don't have somebody doing those kind of things, then the doctors who do the big stuff on the other end, they don't get to do as much of the exciting stuff because we're constantly looking for what it is that we need. It requires the whole team effort to make this possible. Kids Fest that Shelly did last year, designed it, created it, had a great staff from Oklahoma as well as California who led it. She did it again this year. She was not able to go. A, a wonderful lady, Carla from Oklahoma, headed it up. Uh, Lee from our church was part of that team. It was a great job. They expanded it by a day. It went so well in that village for the second time that now the talk is, they want to add another village to do Kids Fest next year. And uh, here's the great news. On the last day of Kids Fest, uh, I went and preached a 10-minute sermon. Y'all didn't think I could do that, did you? <clears throat> I preached a 10-minute children's sermon. It lasted 30 minutes. Um, but, but that's because it's translated into French, and then it's translated into Lobi. Okay, so a 10-minute sermon takes 30 minutes because of translation. And what's always fascinating about that is sometimes I get carried away and I forget to stop, so I've said four or five sentences, and the translator only uses two sentences, and the last guy only uses one, and then there are times I use a really short sentence, and then they go on for four or five sentences. And, and uh, is that exactly what I said? And, and, but, but anyway, uh, at the end of that, uh, because the, 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 
the things had laid a good foundation for a salvation message they had had every day in Kids Fest. And so I gave them an opportunity to stand if they wanted to pray with one of the leaders there and invite Christ in their life. And, and we had about 10 or 12 of the 5th and 6th graders stand up almost immediately. And that was really exciting to see. And when all the younger kids looked around and saw the 5th and 6th graders standing, all of them stood. <laughs> So I can't really tell you that 100% of the kids who showed up accepted Jesus, but 100% of the kids stood up and said they wanted to know about Jesus, all right? And so that was pretty exciting. Uh, and that village is improving. The dormitory that you all paid for is built. So we have two two-room dormitories. And uh, Madame Elise is in cloud nine. And uh, we will show you some video of the songs they sang and how well these kids are doing. Uh, she had, again, one of her students was the number one scoring test, okay, came out of her school this year, second year in a row. Okay, second year in a row, and that's phenomenal. Uh, they love New Hope Church in the, in the village of Neonan. They love them so much. They, they thought Shelly was going to be there. They called me out of this presentation service where they, they, they dedicated the, the new dormitory and handed the keys, and they weren't going to invite any dignitaries because the dignitaries take a lot of time to talk, and they don't say anything. And there's a lot of protocol. You have to hand the keys to the highest ranking official there who hands it to the second ranking official present who hands it to the third ranking who finally and eventually gets to the chief of the village who then hands it to Madame Elise who we built it for anyway. And, um, but we didn't invite anybody but they all heard about it and they showed up anyway. And um, <clears throat> so, so anyway, that was pretty cool. But Madame Elise went and had somebody pull me out of that service, and she took me through a back door into the new uh, dormitory, and uh, she dressed me, and she had the same articles of clothing there for Shelly, and uh, oh, look, there's a picture of us. That's at that ceremony before, and anyway, we were honored as king and queen of the village for the day, and eventually you'll see uh, that picture. We also put a church roof on a new church in a village just down from Neonan called Nakale. On the medical side, 94 surgeries were performed in six days. And let me tell you what's remarkable about that. Is over 12 of those surgeries took more than seven hours, and one of them took almost 12 hours to accomplish. Uh, remove this giant, giant growth off this face of a lady that was already pushing into her brain. She was about 22 years old. She loves Jesus. Um, and um, uh, I just, I fell in love with her this year. <clears throat> we, uh, <clears throat> the only thing I brought back from Africa is dust, and it's still in my throat. A uh, lot, a lot of dust. Um, more children were treated uh, with life-altering surgeries than ever, ever before. 47, we had the most anesthesiologists we've ever had before, full-fledged anesthesiologists. Not, 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 uh, we've had some of the past who, weren't, who assist anesthesiologists, and they, so there's some cases they just would not do because they didn't think they had the training. 47 cataracts, literally there were people who were leading their relatives by a stick into the compound. That's the way they lead the blind. Is they hold a stick and they have a stick and they follow them. Led them in. Literally there were seven or eight who were completely blind, had not seen for years, and they walked away with sight just because of the cataracts. Unbelievable. <laughs> Tony, uh, Tony be proud. He, you know, he sent over some prosthetic eyes with me the first year I went. and We put in a little boy and we showed you those pictures. There was a, a woman who got a prosthetic eye, all right, on this trip that got placed. 480 patients were seen at a clinic. Eye care and glasses were fitted for over 300 individuals, and that was Lindsay's area of service. Plus, we had dental service for the very first time uh, in the, uh, the Doropo area. Uh, 18 Ivorians were saved out in the courtyard in front of the hospital by the village pastors who were roaming that area, sharing their faith, and 18 received Christ. I had the privilege of preaching in a village church, the same one I did the year before. I got to baptize 12 that day. Uh, no fetish burning this year, but the pastor assured me next year they would have some fetishes to burn. That will be another experience. Um, uh, we had one man, uh, about six foot four at the end of the service, 
uh, in the village church that I preached in last year when I gave an invitation, uh, stood up and received Jesus Christ. Only one standing, all right? Uh, about 80, but he stood up, and the pastor told me he'd been attending church for only about two months, was coming with another friend, and it was great to see him accept Christ. Lindsay got to go to Defite's village. That's where she built a church. Uh, Lindsay raised the money all on her own outside of New Hope Church um, because she wanted to build a church for a new friend that she had met there named Defite. And um, she raised enough money to build four churches. And we got to go back to this village where Defite is. And um, she gave away 44 backpacks that her mother and her mother's church had put together for all the students in that village. There were 18 um, boys and uh, 26 girls who attend public school from that village and every one of them got a backpack with school supplies and t-shirt and so she was able to take those give those directly to those kids called them by name and presented it to them in the village underneath the tree and uh, and then one lady stepped forward 80 years old tears streaming down her face hugged Lindsay and said it's because of you that I can go to church on Sundays I'm too old and I can't walk the seven miles it would take to go to the Doropo Church. But because you came, because you loved, because you gave, I get to go to church in my own village. Hugged her with tears going down her face. It was incredible. Um, The two things we're most grateful for, um, cooler than normal temperatures. (laughs) Literally the first night, I woke up with my teeth chattering. All right, I had to find a towel out of my briefcase to go along with the blanket that I had to warm up. It got cool every single night, unlike last year. All right, so very, very different. We're grateful for that. And then maybe the coolest thing for a lot of different reasons is <clears throat> Mike, earlier this year, was invited by somebody who knows, who knows somebody who is a brother to the president of the assembly in the Ivory Coast. And Mike got an invitation to present 1040i in front of the National Assembly of the Ivory Coast. It's kind of like our, um, uh, our House of Congress. And the president of the assembly was so impressed by what he heard, he sent his brother out in the hallway to catch Mike before he left and said, I don't know what I can do, but if there's one thing I could do to make your, your trip in Ivory Coast better, what would it be? And Mike said, if you could give us some security guards so that our travel is not hindered. Because every major village we travel on this 18-hour road trip to get from the airport to Doropo, uh, some of the larger villages, they set up all on their own security gates, and you can't get through because they're looking for payoffs. If you want to continue on the road, you got to pay us. And so sometimes there's hassles there. And uh, when we showed up this year, he didn't give us one, he didn't give us two, he gave us 12 of the presidential guard. These are the green berets, the special forces of their country. I mean, these guys have got the hats and the Uzis, and I mean, they gave us four vehicles. There was a vehicle in front, a vehicle in back, and two vehicles in between our vehicles. And I tell you what, when these guys stick their head out of their car with their sirens that are going on top as we approach the village, you, these guys can't move fast enough to get those guard gates down and get out of the way. Last year, what took us two and a half hours to get from the compound to the airport to come home, with these guys leading the way, We never stopped one time at anything, even a stoplight. When the traffic, when when five lanes of traffic were full going eastbound, which is the way we were going, they just went into the westbound lanes and led our parade. We We made it in 32 minutes and dropped us off right at the front door of the airport. These guys were awesome. So that was incredible. Oh, thank you, whoever gave me water. Hmm. So anyway, that's the updates, and uh, let's jump into Psalm 19. If you came this morning expecting a Valentine's Day sermon, you got it on the video during the offertory, (laughs) because we are going to be in Psalm 19 today. Have you ever felt like that God sometimes ignores you? Have you ever felt like you have been yelling towards heaven and nobody was listening? Have you ever sense that you were knocking on a door and you could hear and sense movements on the inside, but nobody showed up at the door? If you've ever had those kind of feelings, you're not alone. I trust you. 
Believe me. There's many a person I know, including myself, who I've struggled with that moment of divine silence. That moment when, from my perspective, it seems like that God is indifferent to me. And sometimes, I'll be honest, it seems to last longer than a moment. It's after a calamity or right in the middle of a tragedy. And as a victim, we're trying to crawl out. And we cry out with an expectation of some kind of immediate relief. And it just doesn't come. A spouse who has been by your side for years packs up and walks out. One who has been faithful for decades wanders away. And the one who is left alone with betrayal faces what seems to be an endless series of responsibilities. And you turn to God seeking divine intervention, some, some, some heavenly comfort some spiritual reassurance. We look for miraculous provisions only to be met with silence. It's awful, isn't it? And equally challenging are those moments when we grapple with health problems. No prayer seems to change the circumstances. Silence from heaven doesn't lower our fever or lessen our pain or lighten our physical burden. Surprisingly, God included in his hymnal, in the musical collection of songs called the Psalms in the Bible, Psalm 19 directs our attention towards the skies. And David has something to say about these mind-numbing, heart-rendering times of silence on earth. The lyric to this Psalm of David, it falls nicely into two sections. It's divided kind of right in the middle between six and seven. And the break falls so cleanly and so neatly that there are some people who have suggested that maybe there were two authors to this song. But, but I have confidence in scholars for, for decades and centuries who say, no, David wrote this. And he wrote the entire song because he had a clear understanding of the God who created the world and the God who communicates truth. And the transition of themes, which falls between verses 6 and 7, the first, the first six verses deal with the world that God has created. And the second section deals with the truth that God wants to communicate. And when you bring these two together, it gives you and I hope in the midst of what we believe is a season of silence. This entire song brought David much needed relief during those occasions when he thought God didn't care. And he gives hope to many generations of us who've grappled with the grind, the daily grind sometimes of divine indifference. <coughs> Throughout this song, David reminds us that the Lord is not only close to his creatures, but that God cares specifically about you and about me. If you like nice, neat outlines, let, let me give you one, and then we'll, we'll read the psalm, and you'll see how it kind of lays together. The first six verses, the major theme is the world God has created, for creation declares God's glory. Verses one through four is the overall declaration that God is consistent in creation. Sometimes God seems to be silent, but God's presence is universal. Then he uses a specific illustration to talk about that, and he uses the sun in verses 4 through 6, the sun, S-U-N. But you'll find some interesting parallels between the rising of the sun, S-U-N, and the impact of the rising of the sun, S-O-N, in the illustration in which he uses. Verses 4 and 5, he describes the appearance of the sun. He describes it as a tent, as a bridegroom, and as a strong man. Then he talks about the activity of the sun in verse 6. It's rising, how it completes its circle, and how its eat, heat influences and impacts our world. The, the second half of this chapter is the truth that God has communicated in verses 7 through 13. You see, just as, as creation declares God's glory, God's truth, the scriptures declare his grace. 
talks about its presence among us in verses 7 through 9. The truth of God is given at least five titles. Uh, characteristics of God's truth, six are given, and there's multiple benefits, but we'll highlight at least four of the, the benefits of God's truth. And then, then David talks about the value of God's truth in verse 10, and he uses two analogies, gold and honey. Gold, the worth that you have been given that you put in your pocket, and honey, the taste in your mouth that is left when you've eaten something good. And then he talks about the truth and how it works within us in verses 11 through 13. That truth warns us away from sin. It rewards us. It gives us discernment. And it reveals to us the presence of God. And then this song has a benediction to it. It has a closing. There's a closing prayer. And in this closing prayer, we get the sense that our soul should long for God's guidance. So what we have is God's glory, God's grace, and God's guidance outlined for us in this particular chapter. One of the ladies in the 8 o'clock service came to me as I finished the sermon, and she says, Pastor Tim, you probably don't remember this, but several years ago you challenged us with the last verse of Psalm 19. And she said, I want you to know I've made that my prayer every morning before I get out of bed, and I've made it my prayer every night when I go to bed. And she said, I can't tell you the difference it's made when I start my day realizing that I want the words that come out of my mouth and the meditations that come out of my heart be to those which are honoring God. It's made all the difference in the world. I thank you for sharing that. It's good to know. I want you to make these next few minutes very personal. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to begin to think of a time in your past when you thought that it seemed like God wasn't listening or that God had abandoned you. I want to open an old wound today. I want you to think about that. And, and you know what? For some of you, it might not be too long ago. It might be very recent. In fact, out of three services today, there could be some of you who said, Tim, I don't have to go to my past to find one. I'm in that moment right now where I think God seems to be indifferent. So I want you to open that wound a little bit, and I want you to think, what were the circumstances that brought you to the thought that God didn't care what advice was it you were looking for that you didn't think you were getting? And has your perspective from the past, if you're in it right now, there'll be no perspective change yet. Maybe by the end of the service, there might be. But, but what, what's your perspective now about God in times where you believe he's been indifferent? <clears throat> so let's jump in and see how God speaks through creation and through his truth. Let's read the chapter. Follow along with me if you would. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or knowledge where the voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all of the earth, and the words to the ends of the earth. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from a pavilion. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course, it rises at the end of the heavens and it makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Then it jumps into very practical, the disciplines of the word, the benefits of the word. In fact, in my Bible, what I did some years ago is in one color of ink, I underlined the different words for the truth of God, which is going to be law statutes and precepts and then in a different color of ink I underlined the benefit so for example in verse 7 the law of the Lord is perfect that's underlined in blue in my Bible the next phrase reviving the soul I highlight that in red so I have the discipline of the word of God and the benefit of the word of God and I can see it very very quickly when I read this chapter so here's the way it looks. The law of the Lord is perfect, and what does it do? It revives the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, and what does it do? It makes wise the simple. Do you think you're simple-minded? You ever think, boy, I'm not as smart as somebody else? I do. Remember when I sat on the Nancy Hines hospice board? Oh, was I a duck out of water there. Attorneys and accountants and CEOs of corporations. 
you want to become wise, no matter your station in life, know that the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Know them, and it will make you wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, and it gives joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, and it gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, and it endures forever, keeps us clean. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, the honey from the honeycomb. It's better than pleasure. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern their own errors? Who can forgive their own hidden faults? Keep your servant from willful, or in the old King James it says, presumptuous sins. Presumptuous. Eh, God will forgive me, I'll do it anyway. May those things not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Here's the closing prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. <clears throat> Psalm 19 is power-packed with theology in a very small space. We're going to hit some highlights. It's a veritable treasure chest of truth. For six verses, David looks up. He looks heavenward. And by the way, folks, that's always a good direction when you're down. It's a good direction to investigate. When you're down, look up, all right? It changes your whole perspective. He ponders the vast in universe surrounding our little globe. He looks into the realm of deep space in these first six verses. David lets us know that God uses the heavens and their expanse to declare his greatness in verse 1. And then the poet Keen reminds us that this declaration of God's presence in our world, when we think he's silent, he he is not absent. He may be quiet, but he is not absent. He says he is consistent day to day. He is consistent night to night. He might be silent. There may be no speech nor words, but it's universal. All the earth to the end of the earth, God can be discovered. According to this song, God's majestic universe contains a message. In fact, it's a very bold announcement. Regardless of the time, night or day, location, or what your native language is, if we look up, we are able to hear his message. I alluded to a story I've told several times here about just about four weeks ago, the story of a Lebanese-Armenian woman who was new to the States, and while she was looking out the window of her kitchen, less than two feet away, a sparrow landed on the branch of a tree, and as she looked at that, that bird preening there on the tree, she realized she was looking at a creation that only God could make, and she started her search to find God. Our own Errol Allard who attends our church here, tells me how, how God brought Errol to himself. And if, if, if you would see, uh, if, if you remember Errol from, from his days before fatherhood, and he was a strong, virile athlete, good at his sport. And he said, Tim, one night my life was miserable from the inside out. And he said, one night I went to my backyard to be alone to try to figure out what my next step was going to be. And he says, as I laid there looking up and I saw the stars, all of a sudden I realized there is a God. And Errol found his way to God from creation. God says, even my, if you won't cry out, if I won't cry out, I'll make the rocks and trees cry out that I, I live and I exist. We have a creator whose power supersedes all human kings and governments. Because authority implies accountability, you and I can be reasonably sure that this creator of the universe, the ultimate ruler, one day will require everybody to stand before him and be judged. Do you remember Psalm 1 we preached three weeks ago? Do you remember how it ended? For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I grew up as a small child in a generation where hell, fire, and damnation was preached a lot from the pulpit. And I said, when I become a preacher, I'm going to preach more about heaven than I ever do about hell. And, and for 30 some odd years, that has been true. But I have to make a confession at this stage of my life. I think I went overboard. And I preached far too much. Not that you can never preach too much about heaven. What I think I didn't do is I missed the opportunity to remind people you see, we almost give an attitude that, okay, if I don't get to heaven, then I'm just, eh, not there. No, no. 
if, if by the grace of God you don't inherit heaven when you die, you inherit the judgment of your own sin, and it's called hell. There's no, there's no other option. There's no other place. And this God who created, this God who says, out of my own creation, you can see me, says one day you'll be held accountable. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, when he said, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wicked deeds. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. I referenced a quote by Sir Isaac Newton about, uh, about three weeks ago. Sir Isaac Newton, known as the father of modern-day science. Do you know one of the reasons why Sir Isaac Newton launched his study into science? It was because he thought science revealed the character of God, as Romans 1, 18 says. And so Isaac Newton started science with the idea that we can prove more and more and more about the existence of God. And where has science gone since the father of science launched it? with the idea to use science to prove that God doesn't exist. And yet, as yet, guess what? Scientists no longer believe. Scientists no longer believe. They don't write much about this that the common person reads, but scientists don't believe really a whole lot about the Big Bang Theory anymore. They really don't believe in the process of evolution as the way we got here. Now what they've come to is there's this intelligent design somewhere out there in space. <laughs> Duh. His name is God. His name is God. God said you can find me if you look for me. But see, what people are doing is they're not finding him because they're not looking for him. They don't want to acknowledge his existence. Do you get this? God reveals his eternal power and divine nature so clearly that all of humanity is without excuse. Don't believe that God has hidden himself from the world. If there is a man or a woman, a boy or a girl who is looking for God, God will find them in a sparrow on a branch, in the stars in the backyard. You can find him. Don't believe that God has hidden himself from the world. Every intelligent being lives every waking moment under the constant reminder of God's presence, sovereignty, and power. Stubborn unbelief causes humanity to miss God's persistent message. Anyone who struggles with the mystery of God's silence and indifference, whether it's while picking up the pieces after a disaster or recovering from this world's loss of a loved one or trying to find a burst of hope beyond divorce, we only need to look up. God is speaking Bob Thomas, my yeah, 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 yeah friend from Oklahoma, <laughs> on, um, on one of his music CDs has a song that ranks amongst my favorites. I remember listening to it driving in the car going down the road, and I began to cry. Listen to the chorus of the song. He still speaks, and I know his voice. Sweeter sound never heard by mortal ears. And to think that God, by his own choice, would speak to me, it makes me rejoice. He still speaks, and I know his voice. Here's the verses. Amidst a hustling, clamoring world, sounds like ours, doesn't it? Sometimes it's hard to hear when the voice of God is speaking to my soul. But in my quiet time alone, in front of a kitchen window or a backyard, when I approach his holy throne, his tender words fall gently on my ears. There are so many who still doubt that God can speak today. They laugh, they mock when we say we've heard from God. Yet that still small voice of God is heard above the doubters of this world. His timeless words ring out with hope today. He still speaks. I know his voice. Do you recognize his voice when he speaks to you? 
Maybe the indifference is not God to us. Maybe we don't hear his voice because of our indifference towards him. Notice the sun symbolism in verses 4 through 6. Both its appearance and its activity provide ample information to anybody who asks, is there a God? No one other than our God could create, sustain, and employ such a heavenly body as the sun. Its size, its temperature, its distance from us, thanks to that perfect filter system of our atmosphere, provides us with just the right amount of heat and light so that we survive. I am not a scientist, but I've done some reading, and I understand that if the sun was just a couple of miles closer, our earth would burn up. If, if the sun was just a, a, a mile or two farther away from us, we would all freeze to death. I understand if our rotation on the axis was any different than what it is, we would spin off into oblivion. And all of that, an accident? What part of nature do you find most awe-inspiring? Everything in the universe testifies to a creation. Maybe it would be a good idea for you and I to spend some time investigating our creation and learning about the handiwork of God. This God who creates is not silent. The heavens may declare God's power and glory, but they stop short of revealing to us the will of God, the plans of God, And the promises of salvation. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss this. The heavens may declare God's power and glory. But they do not declare his will, his plans, and his promises of salvation. God has communicated these marvelous truths in his word. The living scriptures, the Bible. You see, all of a sudden, in a shift of perspective, David turns from the general evidence of God's creative power to the specific evidence of God's desire for a relationship with his people. And the truth of God has been communicated to us in a lot of different ways. And we highlighted that as we read the chapter. The law is perfect, restores the soul. The testimony is sure, making wise the simple, the precepts are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of God is clean, it endures forever. And so we listed all of that. Those are, those are the values of God's word. This, this, this is God telling us what his will, plans, and promises, and love for us is. <clears throat> when I got to my office this morning, considerably later than my normal arrival time on a Sunday morning, But I found sitting on my desk a picture and a plaque and a Valentine's card. It was Shelly telling me she loves me. It was Shelly writing a note in that card saying, let's celebrate in Cabo. It's Shelly letting me know the promises she has in her heart for me. I could could have chosen not to have opened the envelope. And I could have said, well, Shelly doesn't love me. And nothing would have been further from the truth. It's because I hadn't read the Valentine. I could have said, wow, Shelley's kind of indifferent because I didn't read the Valentine. This is God's Valentine to every one of us. Amen. And maybe you think he's indifferent and maybe you think he's silent because it remains on your desk, on your nightstand, on your kitchen table, in your car seat. And you don't read of his love and his promises and his rewards and his benefits. I want you to take quick notice of the change between verses 1 through 6 and 7 through 13. In the first six verses, David uses the word God. And in verses 7 through 13, he uses the word Lord. 
In the first section, David uses the word El, E-L, which is God's generic title in the Old Testament. It means God, the mighty one, full of strength. In the second section, David uses God's name, the sacred name of God, represented by four consonants, Y. W H W Y H W H. Typically, we translate that Yahweh, and it's translated Lord in the Old Testament. God is not only a powerfully creative force, but he is a person with whom we are able to have a relationship with. What is the word that David uses in the most memorized chapter of the Bible? The who is my shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd. This is a word that indicates relationship with God. The God of creation is over all, but the Lord is only Lord if he's in your life. The Lord is my shepherd. Personal. Scrutinize the title sequence God gives his word, law, testimony, precepts, commands, judgments. Then the characteristics, perfect, sure, right, pure, righteous. And then the benefits, they restore the soul. They make wise the simple. They bring rejoicing in our heart and enables us to see. Talk about communicating with effectiveness. No one can name another book or a piece of literature that can do as an effective job in the life of all humankind as the words of this book. While the Lord is likely to speak, not likely to speak to you audibly, he is not silent. He has spoken to us. He said, and he continues to say more than you and I could absorb or ever apply. How much time do you devote each week to reading God's Valentine to you? How does this compare to other activities that you are engaged with? Make it personal. You see, God's word is incomparable. After God described the effectiveness of God's word, he's motivated to describe now the value of God's word. He appraises God's words with two illustrations, gold and honey. As the king of Israel, David knew about gold. He had a lot of it himself because he realized in order to perform his duties as a king, he had to come with a sense of great power. And it was gold in his treasury that gave him that kind of power. But notice he adds a phrase, fine gold. This, this separates this from gold of jewelry and trinkets. This is gold that has been melted down. All the impurities are taken out of it. And throughout history, God has been, gold has been made more precious by melting it down, getting rid of the impurities so that we end up with a concentrated, unadulterated, welted power in the form of gold bullion. And that is the word of God. And then he uses the term honey, but not just honey, honey in a honeycomb. Honey in those days was the sweetest, most delectable food on earth. And I'm sure David remembered times as a shepherd when he he stumbled upon a beehive and he found honey in a honeycomb to a guy living off the land out in the wilderness. Finding a honeycomb is like finding a treasure, pure calories in the most delectable form. There's metaphors. This This is a metaphor that is charged with descriptive phrases. Think about honey in a honeycomb. It is provided through the work of someone other than ourselves. The bee virtually lays the honey on a platter called a honeycomb. My Uncle Connell, when I was a kid growing up in church, he, he, he was a beekeeper. And he would often bring foil trays of honey with a slice of a honeycomb in it. I think Unc was trying to get sweeter to his per- sweetness to his personality. And, and he would bring those, and I loved it. And do you know, unless you like chewing on a honeycomb, Do you know it's really hard to get the honey out? And so, you know the easiest way to do it? (laughs) Personally, man, it is is so, so good. But what, what did I do to have the honey? Nothing. The bees did it. Second thing, it's a natural food that doesn't need a long time of digestion before it goes to work in our body. Honey provides instant energy. As a, as a kid in junior high and high school, do you know what I had in my, my pack before I ran a race and track? I had a bare bottle of honey. Remember the sun, sun bee bear, all right? And, and, and it had the squeeze top on it, all right? And so about 20 minutes before we'd race, bat, ah, why? Because you get that... You get that jolt of of immediate energy. And it's also a flavor like no other. Nothing has the sweetness and rich taste of honey. What a great analogy. Listen to these metaphors in comparison to God's word. Through the efforts of another, we have his word. It goes to work immediately upon entering our spiritual system. And no other piece of literature can compare to its uniqueness. And finally, in verses 11 through 13, tells us the specific ways God's truth works within us. Through the scriptures, we are warned of evil and its danger. 
The person who knows and applies the Bible is kept from numerous sins because he or she believes God's warning signs. You know why I don't steal? Because God says, thou shalt not steal. Because I grew up hearing my dad tell the story about the one time he stole a pocket knife from the general store down from the house he lived in. And when he put his clothes in the dirty laundry for his mom to clean, he forgot to take the knife out and hide it. And so when grandma shook his pants pockets out, out fell a knife. And she asked him, where'd you get this? And when my dad said he stole it, my grandfather escorted him the quarter mile that it was from their house to the store. And it wasn't the swats he got on his backside that was the worst part of his discipline. It was having to walk in to a man who was a friend of their families and say, I stole this. And God's word will give us warning about why we shouldn't do some of the things that we do. It gives us the ability to discern right from wrong. And then let me wrap this up. Most of us need to learn to listen with retuned ears. David wraps up his thought and feelings with a brief prayer. It's a prayer that he wants God's guidance. We've seen God's glory. He demonstrates his grace by being personal with us. And now David wants guidance. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations. What's the fourth thing that keeps us in a less more lifestyle? <laughs> contemplation. That's what this is. Let the words of my mouth and the contemplations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. While there may be times we believe that God is silent, the problem is not that he isn't communicating. It's that we are not listening. Withdrawing from the pains of life may have us cut off from many ways in which God expresses his love through the inner transformation of the Holy Spirit, through nature around us, through caring friends and family, through opportunities we have to serve our neighbors. Maybe our ears are clogged with self-pity or, or our faith is faltering and we may refuse to believe that God cares. The fact remains, as stated in this song, God has revealed himself through his creation and through his scriptures. He doesn't need to speak again. He's spoken everything we need. Here's what I've learned. In the seasons that I think God is silent or indifferent, I need to first look up and be reminded of his glory. And then I need to look within. And when I look within, I will hear his voice. Can you remember that? When you are faced with your next moment of divine indifference, you first of all should do what? Look up, and then you should look in. Let's say that one more time. Let's look up, and let's look in. Stay in this holy book. Dare God by your presence in his word to that he'll fulfill his promises that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will take on a new pattern of godliness and powerful influence in our lives. And if we do that, God will no longer seem distant or silent. Our Father, maybe there are some who are here this morning and they need to start by looking up. And they need to be in awe of a God who creates. We need to get our attention off ourselves and our circumstances. We need to stop with near-sighted, lower-story vision. And we need to simply look up and say, Oh, ah, I was so focused on myself. But God, I forgot about you. But now, God, that I am focused on you, <laughs> I surprisingly have forgotten about myself. And God, maybe there's some who've, they're coming here today was they're looking up. And because they're here today, they're now going to look in. They're going to look into your love letter, into your Valentine's card to them. And they're going to realize you were a God who still speaks and you are a God who chooses to speak to us. And may that make our heart rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.